Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Lee Langley. I am the uh, Senior Systems Engineer here at uh, Cyber Reason. I cover the EMEA patch. Thank you for attending my attack simulation presentation uh, today. Um, we've got roughly an hour, so I will be moving at pace, but please feel free to post questions uh, on the questions side of your webinar screen there. Um, in terms of myself, uh, I've been in the cyberspace for uh, over 22 years now, um, so predominantly in intrusion prevention, pen testing, those sorts of spaces, uh, and more laterally now for Cyber Reason as a systems engineer. So in terms of uh, an agenda, in terms of what you can expect from this session today, is a brief overview of who Cyber Reason are uh, and how we came to be, why we exist, what, it, what is the problem that Cyber Reason solve, I'm going to cover a bit of market, uh, sorry, a bit of technical research called Operation Soft Sell that you may have seen uh, recently in the news. And I'm going to provide a brief uh, attack simulation that shows some of the mindsets and tools used by some of the attackers uh, and also pen testers. Um, and then I'm going to see and show and demonstrate what the Cyber Reason platform saw when we carried out that attack. Okay. So in terms of Cyber Reason as an organization, relatively young company founded in 2012. Um, great news this morning for us is that we received our Series E funding to the tune of an additional $200 million. Why is that important? Well, it shows that our investors feel that we are a rapidly growing organization. It gives backing to our customers that we are the market leader in what we do. Um, and it's a, a general uh, credibility play in the market space for a rapidly growing uh, company. In terms of what Cyber Reason offer from a platform point of view, well, we provide next generation antivirus, anti-ransomware, fileless malware protection, endpoint detection, remediation and response, and finally threat hunting as a platform and as services from our organization. Important notes there, major investors from the likes of Lockheed Martin, uh, who were primarily a customer, moved to, to be an investor. And then our primary funding is from SoftBank, located out in J Japan. Um, if you require further information, then please re reach out to us on that. But you'll probably see information around SoftBank's in investments today if you do some research. Okay, so why do we exist? What is the problem that Cyber Reason solve? And what makes us unique? Well, when we speak to our customers, every single one of them tells us the same problem. And that is that they bought over the years point solutions from a security prevention and a detection aspect. And that all of those security products are fighting for mindshare and jumping and screaming as loud as they can for someone's attention. All of those tools have an associated cost uh, and they are becoming more complex to use across the board to the point where most security breaches that you hear about today happen because of poor management, poor policy, and the fact that the security teams are generally overwhelmed. Not necessarily that the platforms themselves are particularly poor at security. So what does the story of Cyber Reason and how do we solve that particular problem? Well, again, speaking to the market and to our customers and focusing on the left-hand side of this slide, a large number of our customers focus on the prevention mindset. A huge amount of time and budget is spent trying to prevent things from getting in, and that is absolutely correct. That is the right way to go. They're focusing on things like firewalls, proxies, uh, AV software, and the general tool sets. And that is great for stopping those volumetric attacks, things that people know about, the nightclub bouncer on the door, if you will, of security. But hopefully we can all agree that a targeted, sophisticated or even an unknown attack or adversary will breach all of those security measures that are in the security play today. And the problem our customers find is that because of the noise that's generated by those security platforms and products or by not having visibility, the time that it takes our customers to understand that a breach has taken place to when a product generates an alert to when our customers understand that an incident is taking place and that they've rooted out false positives, to be in a position to respond to that attack and then more importantly to remediate and kick out a threat or an adversary is simply too long. 
In many cases, it's months, if not years. So the problem that Cyber Reason solve here is we crunch down every aspect of a cyber breach. We provide those market leading prevention technologies to remove the obvious attacks and to reduce the noise on our incident response teams. But then laterally at the detection stage, we crunch down the alert, the time to respond, the time to remediate at every single stage, whilst making our instant responders more agile and more powerful. Okay. I'm gonna talk about uh, Operation Soft Cell. If you find this interesting, please reach out to us for more detailed information. If you head to our website, uh, Operation Soft Cell uh, is all over our, our main page and we could talk about how that came to be and what happened during that. But essentially Operation Soft Cell was when we detected inside one of our telecommunications customers very sophisticated and targeted uh, attacks that we laterally attributed to uh, what we believe to be APT10 or the Chinese uh, State Cyber Division. And what we found was that this adversary was breaking into a number of telcos, not just this one, and was collecting and stealing call and telemetry data from a number of, uh, of targets that were customers of those telcos to specifically track where they were, what they were doing for espionage purposes. And why was this important? For two reasons, this is very important for not only cyber reason, but cyber security as a whole. This adversary took years to carry out this attack. They moved extremely slowly, sometimes with months taking place before additional commands or actions were taking place within this telecommunications company. That was deliberately done to circumnavigate security products like ours uh, and the traditional players because they know that security platforms have a data retention problem. They cannot store data long enough to understand these slow and low attacks that have taken place. Or well, Cyber Reason theoretically has an unlimited, unlimited data retention period. So we were able to go back and understand how long this adversary had been inside this customer's environment and what behaviors were taking place. The second point, which I alluded to there, which is that Cyber Reason doesn't just focus on indicators of compromise. We're not just looking for hashes, for IP addresses. We're not looking for reputations. We're more focused around behavioral analytics, using our machine learning and an artificial intelligence uh, correlation engine. We were able to understand over many months that the attack was taking place and that the adversary may be changing the tool sets that they were using, but their behaviors were the same. In this case, the adversary was detected in wave one using a China chopper wedge shell, which we quickly identified and blocked and prevented using our platform. Only three months later did they come back with a modified version of the same tool. Now with IOC hunting, this just simply wouldn't have worked. We would not have seen this, the adversary returning to the scene of the crime. Like I say, if you want more detailed, further information around soft cell, please reach out. We have a very detailed brief that we can provide. Other sophisticated attacks that we've seen over the last few years was the attack on the Democratic Party around Hillary Clinton and the leaked emails that took place. And why was this important? Well, this was one of the first, but also one of the major uh, breaches that had some more sophisticated and modern attack vectors. In the first instance, we saw phishing emails taking place. Yes, they still work. We see them every day in, in our world and in our customer environments. And if you think about it, although it's a well-known attack vector, it only takes one victim to click on that email to be successful. And we'll see that in my demonstration in a second. The next thing, the reason why it was important is we had fileless malware taking place. This is a term the cyber industry is slightly hyping up, but essentially this is where there's a f no physical file on the operating system or a, a lack of files involved, which then prevents traditional AV from investigating that because they've got nothing that they can hold because the attack is taking place in memory. It's also a way to hopefully circumnavigate things like sandboxing technology, although they are becoming more sophisticated in the marketplace. And then finally, we saw the use of ransomware in this attack. Ransomware not for um, uh, collection of funds, for example, or cyber crime reasons, but more laterally for 
um, disposal of forensics information. So when we've carried out our attack, we use, use ransomware to encrypt and effectively destroy any evidence that we were inside that environment. So in terms of the attack simulation I'm going to walk through today, in terms of the parties that are involved, we have our hacker, our adversary. I will be playing the part of all three members of this particular breach. But our hacker um, has been given a target. They've been doing um, recon or open source reconnaissance of our victim organization, in this case, Acme Incorporated. And he knows that they are going through some downsizing activities. They are making redundancies. And as the case in many redundancies, it's typically IT staff or the first responders that may be let out or um, left the organization. So they know that this organization may be weak from a cybersecurity aspect. We know that the person who's making those redundancies or maybe outsourcing their solution is our CEO of this organization, Maria. But it's highly unlikely that when a breach takes place that we get to our victim or our destination in the first instance. So a softer target in this case is Robert. Robert is the personal assistant to Maria. He receives a lot of emails from all over the organization. He may be slightly less sophisticated when it comes to cyber. And typically personal assistants are the first port of call for things like phishing attacks and uh, uh, pinpointed attacks inside organizations. So in this case, we're gonna send a crafted email from our attacker to Robert with the intent of getting onto Maria's machine. It's simplified, but it gives you an idea of the type of mindset that they would go through. In terms of the timeline and steps that will take place during this attack, the initial infection, as I already alluded to, will be a phishing email that contains a malicious spreadsheet. This spreadsheet contains a PowerShell script that is going to reach out to my command and control infrastructure on the internet, download additional payloads, whilst all the time taking place inside memory without any physical malware or file, uh, files to download. In terms of when we get into the organization, we're then going to carry out some reconnaissance. We're gonna carry out some net bios sniffing of our environment to understand what servers and other collateral we can see around us. Uh, understand that this can be quite noisy and so that there's a trip while we may trip at this particular point. Again, once we have that information and we understand that we want to move from Robert's machine to somewhere else inside our victim's organization, in this case, Maria's laptop, we understand that we are going to have to elevate our privileges within inside the operating system because Robert is highly unlikely to have the privileges that we need to carry out the nefarious activity that we need. So we're gonna carry out some exploitation and privilege escalation at that point. We then want to carry out some persistency. If we get detected, we get caught, or we simply lose communication to our environment, we want to have a persistent backdoor. We want to have um, you know, a service or a registry entry that allows us back in, some sort of Trojan perhaps. In this example, we're simply going to create a backup admin account that allows us to get back in if we're detected laterally. From there, we're going to steal credentials. We're going to use a memory scraping technique called Mimicats. If you're not familiar with Mimicats, please do uh, go away and take a look. It's a well-known tool within the cyber industry that allows us to scrape the memory of passwords and account details of anyone that has logged on to our machines at that time. This is extremely important. We'll come to that in a second. From there, we now have identified targets. We now have credentials that we have stolen. And we're going to use built-in uh, management tools such as PS Exec to move laterally from Robert's machine uh, over to Maria's as the victim. The reason why we're using built-in tools, we don't typically have to bring them with us. They may also bypass security tools that they have in place because they are legitimate management tools. And then finally, we're going to maybe do some uh, data theft. We're going to steal important documents from Maria's machine, and then we're going to wrap up by using ransomware to encrypt the contents of those machines on our way out so that anyone doing instant response after us is really struggling to find any information. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to break out of the, demonstration, uh, the presentation and move to our presentation here. So on my screen, um, I have a number of virtual machines and I also have access to the CyberEason platform. So here, I'm using Kali Linux. K 
Calilix, if you're not familiar with this, is a standard industry tool for penetration testing, but is also used by some attackers. And in this instance, on the left, as you can see from my console, I have a traditional web server. This web server is loaded with exploits and malicious payloads that we're going to call upon when we breach this organization to get us around and give us a foothold in our particular victim. On the right hand side, we have our Metasploit console. Here I've used Metasploit to provide, provide me with a staging post, a number of tools and techniques, and I've also used it to create that malicious uh, spreadsheet that we spoke about earlier on. So these two are our, our, our command control, if you will, and our tools to carry out the breach. I've also then got a number of victim machines. Victim one here being Robert, the personal assistant that we saw in our diagram and as you can see on Robert's screen we have sent Robert a rather lame if you will phishing attempt um, that contains a malicious executable or malicious excel spreadsheet I should say that we're going to open and walk through notice also Robert's machine I have applications open such as uh, Firefox but this could be any application that I have open I've just elected to use Firefox and you'll see why in a second our second machine is victim two, and this is Maria's machine. This is our ultimate goal of where we want to get to. So starting on victim one, Robert has received this email, and he is aware that there are, for example, resizing, outsourcing, all of these sorts of things taking place within his organization. And so he receives this recruitment plan email and thinks he's going to open it. So we open up the attachment, and as you can see, uh, Outlook, sorry, Office is trying to do its thing to prevent the security breaches taking place. But like all users, we do the things that we shouldn't do. So in this case, it's saying do not enable editing. But the Outlook document, excuse me, the Excel document is telling us if you want to read this, you've got to click the enable editing button. And we've also got to enable content. So like all good users, we click the buttons we shouldn't. And the next thing is it's doing the are you really sure? So here we're going to enable content. Now, as I said prior, this uh, Office document is loaded with a uh, PowerShell-based macro script that is going to reach out to our command control infrastructure, if we're lucky, and I have everything set up correctly, we do, um, reach out and download two things. It's going to download an exploit, as you can see, that's taking place here, that is going to be loaded into the memory of, of uh, Office, it's going to exploit the office process before finally downloading a malicious payload. The malicious payload essentially being our application uh, for Metasploits to, to load in. So there you can see we reached out, we grabbed our additional exploits and payloads that injected uh, Metasploits onto that particular machine. So now I have a dial back and what I can do is I can type a number of commands to understand who I'm connected with. So here you can see we have a interpreter session via Windows with those IP addresses, and I've got connectivity to Robert E on that machine. I essentially now own Robert's machine at this point. So we can go ahead and interact with Robert's machine. But I have no concept really as an attacker, what privileges, what rights, where Robert's machine sits in ACME uh, as an organization. So we've got to do a bit of reconnaissance, a bit of looking around, understand what's taking place. So the first command I'm going to carry out is get UID. Get UID just gives me an understanding of the domain and the account that I'm on. For example, if it was a local account, then it would tell me if it was local. So this is a good starting point. And we can carry out a number of commands here that maybe test the privileges that Robert has. But we're going to assume that Robert has very basic user rights um, in this organization. Okay. Now, at this point, alarm bells may be ringing. Alerts on our security tool sets and AVs may already be going off. So the first thing we want to do is hide. We, as an adversary, want to hide ourselves in this organization. And we're going to migrate ourselves and hide inside the memory space of a legitimate application. In this case, Firefox. It could be any other application. So I use the command to PS to show me the processes that are running Firefox. So we have Firefox running on this machine. And I'm going to migrate into the parent process of Firefox. Again, the purpose of this demonstration is not to teach you how to hack. There are more slick, more powerful ways of doing what I'm doing today, but it's to give you that mindset of the activity that takes place during a breach. So we're going to migrate 
our attack, our little application, interpreter, our hacking tool, and we're going to move ourselves into the legitimate memory space of Firefox in an attempt to bypass AV, to bypass an administrator that happens to know, notice anything quirky in our day-to-day -day world. So we're now successfully migrated into Firefox. The next thing we want to do is have a little sniff around and see who around me I can see, what servers and other victims and crown jewels we have in this organization. Now we're going to be using scripts during this attack. You don't want to sit, sit there and watch me log in and type extensive commands. So we've created these pre built scripts. Essentially, this is going to use NetBIOS and sniff and understand on this protocol who else I can see around me. So there's my own machine, which is great, we know that, but I've now got another machine laterally to me, in this case called Maria's CEO. During a typical breach, you may see domain controllers, for example, file servers, web servers, those sorts of things, and you would pivot and move to those different resources as you go through. Now I need to understand what kind of machine I'm sat on now. What, what build is Robert's computer? Is it uh, Windows 10? Is it Windows XP? What is it? So in this case, we're going to use the command sysinfo. Sysinfo gives me built information around Robert's machine. And what's really important here is at some stage, I may want to elevate my privileges. I may want to exploit Robert's machine further. And to do that, I need to know what applications and what version of the operating system we're running. So I'm going to go away now and scour the internet for exploits that exist for this build of Windows. OK, another really important reason why you should keep your operating systems up to date. OK, so I've gone away and I've understood there's an exploit that will affect this build of Windows that uses uh, a pop up exploit within this build of uh, 7601 Windows. OK, so I'm going to background this session, go back to my hackers worktop and I'm going to use uh, an attack and exploit, a technique called reflectively injecting DLLs onto the machine. Um, if you want to Google that, you'll get some further information. Essentially, it's a way of me injecting a DLL onto Robert's machine without even using a file, but injecting that from memory. So again, trying to circumnavigate security tools and trying to circumnavigate administrator tools. So this is going to go and carry out that exploit on Robert's machine. And with a bit of luck, because hacking and pen testing is not always 100%, we're going to get a secondary shell. So we've reflectively injected our malicious payload onto Robert's machine. And because of the system level privileges that that uh, uh, exploit utilized, we should now have elevated privileges. So if I go get UID like we did before, instead of seeing Robert, I've now got system level privileges on this host. This essentially makes me God as far as Robert E's machine is concerned. OK, so now we want to then go through and add our persistency. If you remember my diagram, we want to avoid being caught and we want to add persistency. So the next thing we want to do then is use another script that adds an additional administrator account onto our device. So this very quickly just creates an account that has admin privileges on Robert's machine, just in case they get knocked off and we want to come back. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a hash dump. Now, some of you may or may not know, but when you log on to a Windows machine, your username and a hash of your password is stored on that particular device. OK, and so we can use Mimikatz, in this case, a hash dump script to scrape all of those usernames and passwords from the memory of this particular machine and present them to me. Now, you're going to look at this and think, OK, is that actually useful, Lee? But yes, we have. A, an account name, which is great, as you, now you can see my backup persistent account. But now we have a hash of this password. Now I could take that hash, take that offline and go and decrypt that or de, you know, run that through things like rainbow tables using security tools to give me the actual password in clear text as in readable English. But our operating system doesn't need that. Our operating system will accept and use hash passwords. And the other thing is, think about your own organizations. When your IT systems have to build a hundred or five, a hundred or a million new machines, do they build those machines individually or do they use a gold image, a machine that they build once and then roll out a thousand times to all their laptops, to all their virtual machines out in your organization? And one common vulnerability that we see there is that when they're building those gold machines, they are reusing administrative credentials 
and those credentials are left on those gold images. So it stands to reason that other machines in my organization will have the same administrator, local administrator credentials present on their operating system. And we're going to take that punt and use this administrator credentials to move laterally and attack Maria's machine. But our attacker and our command and control infrastructure has no physical or logical way of seeing Maria's machine. The only attack we've got at this point is through Robert's machine. So we're going to kind of create a pivot point or a VPN tunnel at this point. We're going to use something called Auto Route. This is another tool and script built into Meterpreter that allows us to pivot and bridge from Robert's machine over to Maria's machine and anyone else in this organization. So it's saying, OK, when you come into Robert's machine, I'm going to dump you onto my local network and you can talk to whomever you like. OK, so we've used we've used Robert's machine as a beachhead, if you will. So I'm just going to background here, go back to our attackers stronghold and using that administrative passwords that we gathered earlier, I'm going to use something called pass the hash. Pass the hash is an extremely prevalent attack uh, method. We see this moving around in organizations. If you see nothing else from your security tools other than a pass the hash, that tells you you have been breached. It means that someone is moving around inside your organization. OK, so we're going to do the uh, pass the hash. That's going to take the administrative credentials that we had earlier on. It's going to use legitimate security tools, administrative tools, such as pass the hash. And if you look on the left here, we've now got a new victim that has started dialing in and downloading exactly the same exploit, exactly the same payload that we used in our initial attack. Now we have a third uh, session that is connected to our attacker. So if I do sessions minus I3, and now we do get UID, I should have system level privileges, but we don't know who we are at this point. We don't know who this machine is. We hope it's Maria because that was who we were attempted to communicate. So again, let's do sysinfo. And now you can see that we have moved to Maria's machine. And this whole attack process started with that one email to Robert, that one email. None of the attacks that we have used here have been loaded onto the hard drive of our machine. They've been loaded entirely into memory, again, to circumnavigate security products. At this point, I can download files. I could download uh, important security documents, for example. But now what I want to do on my way out, we're going to cover our tracks using ransomware. And again, I'm going to use in built in PowerShell tools and a command that is built into the operating system that simply says encrypt my operating system. OK, now on our victim machines, I carried out a lot of attacks there. But on our victim machines, they're none the wiser. No pop ups have come up. There's no alerts to say anything has happened. Again, on Maria's machine, if I click on this, you can see that he says, our cyber reason agent, I must turn that off, has detected ransomware and is saying that we are suspending that particular process. But there's no pop ups, no reboots, no blue screens. So I've gone about my, my merry way. So that's the attack. But what did cyber reason see from a platform point of view? So this is where we hope that everything's worked nicely. That's great. We've got our little bubbles popping up. So this is the cyber reason platform. Everything from this point onwards is aimed at an incident response person, whether that's an administrator, whether that's a dedicated SOC analyst, whether that's a managed service provider on your behalf. The ultimate aim of the platform from this point onwards is to simplify a breach to reduce the noise and give you somewhere to start. What you're looking at here are malop bubbles. The size of these bubbles denotes the size of a breach. So if I click on one, for example, it will show that there are two machines involved in this particular breach. The color of the breach denotes the freshness of attack. The brighter the blue, the more recent the attack took place. Ergo, we're telling you what's more important and what's happening right now. OK, all of these are context sensitive, meaning I can click on them and get further information. Down the bottom here, we've also got malware. So you can see here we've detected one threat and we've remediated that one threat. So this is your next gen AV. This is your traditional AV. This is your anti ransomware doing its thing and protecting you. OK, but because this is a more sophisticated attack, we then gone into detection phase. So how would you investigate what we've just seen? If I click on inbox, here you will see a number of individual alerts that have taken place during this breach. So if I scroll down, for example, you can see our malicious process injection across two machines. 
you can see the credential theft taking place. You can see where I injected myself into Firefox. You can see, uh, for example, the pass the hash attack that took place. And this pass the hash attack is extremely important because one thing that Cyber Reason does differently is we correlate all of the events inside an attack. So think about this using a normal security tool, your normal SIEM, your normal AV. We had two machines involved in this attack, so therefore you would have had two alerts elsewhere. There were three stages to this attack, so again, you would have had three alerts to this attack. So in total, this would give you six alerts compared to R1. So we had, for example, some initial infection, some privilege escalation, and then we detected lateral movement. So let's go ahead and click on that. So when we click on this on the top left, we'll give you a narration of what took place, we'll give you scope of the attack, so what were the machines and users involved. You've got the ability to look at communications, i.e. what packets were going in and out during this breach, and we then also got the ability to add comments. So here we could say, I am reviewing this under support ticket 93. And so someone else knows what's taking place there. You can also add context like this is a test, for example. On the right-hand side here, we have graphical representation of what took place. So we have Robert's machine as the source of attack. Robert spawned command.exe as a source process. The reason why we were unhappy is we carried out a pass the hash attack was detected, utilizing administrative credentials. And our victim was Maria spawning an unknown process at this time. We haven't analyzed this. You know, this is a brand new process on that machine. Now below that, Compare this to your traditional security products at AV, which would maybe detect some of this, but would simply put a hand up or raise an alert that says something bad has happened. You've got no context. You don't understand how the attacker got in, what they're doing, what steps they took to get to this breach point. And that is what we're giving you here. Cyber Reason records every event on your endpoint, whether it is good or bad, on your behalf so that laterally you could understand uh, what happened? What were the steps that took place? And is the adversary still in my network? Is this attack still taking place? So right here, you can see what was the first process that took place in my environment. And I can click on that and get further information. Who was patient zero? There was a dwell time of a number of months in this case before Robert then kicked in and I can click on that and get more information. Then we started to understand that an attack was taking place. We saw some privilege escalation executables being loaded into memory, all of these sorts of things. This detection is very, very important for two reasons. We have this concept of unexpected. This is us not knowing about an attack. This is understanding behavior. This is us saying, we did not expect this type of behavior to happen in your environment. This is machine learning doing its, its thing. And the other three reason why this detection is important is we have attributed it to the attack MITRE attack framework. Some of you on the call may be using MITRE, or we attribute our detections against that, so you could actively represent it. Okay, and then you've got the additional stages of the attack taking place. Now I can drill into this in more detail, but for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to leave that. So if you would like a more detailed demonstration, we can absolutely go ahead and do that. But at this point, I have seen enough information as a responder to understand I'm unhappy and I want to stop this attack. So at the top right here, we have the ability to isolate the attack. So if I go back to my victim machine and I click on this, this screen here, and let's do a very basic ping. So let's ping the internet. So we know that this machine is under breach. If I go back to my instant response screen, I'm gonna isolate the attack. And it's going to say these two machines are involved what would you like to do so i'm going to hit isolate that's going to issue an isolate order to my agents so back on my victim machine you can see that the traffic has stopped with the exception of our front end here that you've seen me talking to your management platform or any msp that's managing your estate we can black hole all the traffic so this is containerized this machine at this point so we can then go ahead and investigate and remediate so the other thing we can then do is let's, see, let's call it Firefox. Excuse me. Uh, go back to our screen. Let's get the screens out of the way. Shall we? We're going to stop isolation. Okay. And if I go back to my victims machine in the background there, you will see uh, that the ping has restored.
Thank you, Bill. We have a question. Okay, and so you can see the ping has been restored. The next thing we want to do is remediate this particular attack. Let me just move my screen around. So at the top here, you've got a response button. Now think about how you're doing remediation today. A lot For a lot of our customers, as soon as they receive an alert, that machine gets recalled back to head office. It is re-imaged and sent back out. That consumes time and money. So the aim here is even if this machine is out in the field or it's a virtual machine in AWS, Azure, what have, have you, I can hit click here and have our response capabilities. I'm going to find a better example. Let's go to our interpreter here. Hit respond. And here we've got ability to take remedial action. So I hit remediate and it will say, okay, what machines are involved? Well, Robert is the guy who created the interpreter process. And it's going to say, what do you want to do with it? Now, if you recall from the attack, I migrated myself into Firefox. So Firefox, from our point of view, is now dirty. If this wasn't a memory resident attack, and we had files that we could quantitatively grab and get off the operating system. You can see here with the ability to quarantine those files, to hold them in until we had analyzed what's going on. But also you've got the ability to roll back registry and services that may exist on this machine. And ultimately, if we had a file, we could create a hash and we could issue a preventative order back to all of our agents and say, stop this attack taking place in the future. Now in this issue, we're going to, um, we're going to clear up Firefox. We're going to kill the process that's been dirty in this attack. I'm going to hit, hit apply. That's going to take a few seconds while it issues that prevent order. And if I go back to my victims machine, here you can see Firefox is our open process. We're just going to let that roll in the background. So what's being uh, issued there is a roll up order and you can see that Firefox was closed because it was dirty. We can open up Firefox again and now it will be clean. It will be a brand new process. Okay. Finally, then, if we go back, we may want to investigate what took place and pivot in terms of our operating system. So at the top here, we've got investigation and we can go into more detail. We hit investigate and this takes us to our query screen. So what I want you to do here is think about how you would investigate in your own environment today. If you have the tools, great. But are those tools requiring a really high level of knowledge? Are they requiring you to build complex scripts and queries? SQL style queries, programming style queries for you to investigate what's taking place in your world. So on this screen, you can see the thing that we're unhappy about is Meterpreter, and I can click on that and you can see what the machine was, what the user was, how it came to be, and a timeline of everything that took place. Now I may want to get a graphical view of how that came about, so I click View Attack Tree. And what that will do is build up a graphical view of all of the objects and what happened during this attack. So you can see here, we started with Bridge Server 32 being the very source of this attack. Now, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was the machine learning and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. And that's what you're seeing here. We use our suspicions and evidence of an attack to understand if something bad is taking place. So in this case, you can see that we, our suspicion was we were seeing abusive behavior. Again, notice MITRE references here. And we were seeing evidence of wrongdoing. It connected to another internal address. We saw bypass, uh, an exploit here, AppRock and bypass being used to inject this particular process. And we can work down through the properties of the attack, the commands that we used. We can grab the files if we want to, so we can forensically grab them to analyze what took place. If they were signed or not, we've got a hash of the particular file involved if we want to pivot, understand where else that took place. Now, because we're using behavior analytics, I can say, show me who else is behaving in a certain way. This is not indicators of compromise. This is indicators of behavior. Show me who else has behaved in that particular way. And we can work our way down the, through the attack tree, looking at other suspicions if we want to, other evidence, before we get to the point that we saw Meterpreter injected in this operating system. Other things, I won't go into too much detail here, but the other thing you can do is build up complex queries very, very quickly with a very little knowledge of cyber. So we can say, okay, we've got this malicious process. What was the user that generated that? Get results. We can see that Robert was the user that generated that. And then I can start to filter on that and ask other questions. What domain was Robert on? What suspicions was Robert generating, for example? What active directory privileges? Can we harvest from Robert's active information? And we can pivot on all of these. 
This is really the power of cyber reason. Other types of queries that our customers like to know, for example, if I go back to the, the structure, I can do things like show me processes that are, and I hit filter, running specific product types because you saw in this attack we utilized an Excel document. So show me other product types that are related to Microsoft Office and we hit apply. And what I want you to focus on is the speed at which we can construct these reports. And I, oh, excuse me, we've asked it a question that we don't have the answers to. Um, we can also say, what processes have we got in our environment here that have connections that are potentially outbound of our organization and hit results? And I can say, okay, I want to see the machines that generated those processes. So you can see as we build our table, our table, and forgive me, this is a canned environment, so the data is not there, but you can see how we can build these queries. The next thing, other queries that we like to do is we can say, show me files that exist in my environment that have specific contents. And I just hit results. Obviously, that's going to say nothing, but you can get the you get the point. I can also do searches for other types of queries. So I click see more and I say mount point. This is threat hunting. This is analyzing our data, looking for uh, information in our environment. Typical examples here is I could say, show me removable drives. Show me CD-ROMs, removable drives, all those sorts of things. And you can see the speed and simplicity of which I'm building that report. So that's my demonstration. I'm going to leave it at this point. Uh, there are a number of questions that uh, have been posted during today's presentation, so feel free to add to them. But the first one that's come through uh, from the audience was, this attack demonstrated fileless attacks. Can you explain the difference again and why current technology isn't sufficient? So yeah, so basically, um, fileless attacks, and a number, we're not the only technology, let's be very clear, we're not the only technology that claims to deal with fileless attacks. It's more of the joined up detailed approach that we provide. But why fileless attacks are important is that they can be loaded and uh, damage can be done from a very simple script such as PowerShell. And to reiterate, if there's no physical file left on the operating system, traditional technology um, is inadequate in grabbing those files and analyzing them. Okay. The next question that came along was, uh, you, when you have your own agent on the endpoints, aren't you susceptible to kernel level breaches where your software gets disabled by the attacker? That's a great question. Um, so yes, so cyber reason, 99% of the cyber reason agent sits in place in the user space of the operating system. That's a conscious decision that allows us to give, gather the amount of data that we need to do what we do. However, the 1% is we do have a kernel level driver, a watchdog process. Those kernel level drivers do two things. The first one is when we detect a malicious file, maybe it's next gen AV, and we want to prevent that file from executing, you have to do that at the kernel. We have to stop it from executing before the operating system can do anything with it. The second part of that kernel level process is our watchdog process that sits across both user space and kernel and helps prevent uh, uh, agents tampering. So yes, we take reasonable actions to prevent the agent itself from being disabled. So if you, dis if you disable services or stop services, that watchdog process at the kernel level will reinitiate those services for you. No agent is 100%, but we're very hardened in what we do. Okay, the next question, hopefully that answers your, your first question. Uh, all of these features seem great, but what impact will all these features have on my endpoint? This is a very good question. So, in, and this happens in every single customer I go to, where they may have two or three different agents trying to do what we do and provide to that customer. And in a proof of concept, I will often inject statistics and say that cyber reason will do no harm. Cyber reason should not consume more than 5% of resources on your endpoint. In many, many cases, you should not expect cyber reason to consume more than 2% CPU memory on your endpoint. OK, and to the point where we're often a lot less uh, heavyweight on the endpoints than uh, traditional tr technology. If I know that we're competing against a competitor that I've seen before, I will often put that in my success criteria because we are very, very lightweight. We're also extremely lightweight in terms of uh, network utilization, typically less than five megabytes per device per day. OK, uh, and we have a number of customers who can prove that as well. 
Okay. Uh, let me just see what else we've got in terms of questions, endpoints. Uh, can we talk about data privacy and what we collect on the platform? So this is a great one for us. So um, Cyber Reason exists as both a cloud and on-premise offering. Today's demonstration you saw me run was me running this in my own lab in a contained environment. Okay. So from a um, from a data privacy point of view, some of our customers uh, prefer to have on-premise in their own data center rather than cloud. I would say high percentage, 95 plus of our customers are running cloud, but then that leads to another issue around GDPR. Where is the data that we are collecting? And there is personally identifiable information in this data collection, such as IP addresses, usernames, file paths, machine names. So then the question is, do you want this information being stored out of your region? So Cyber Reason is completely detached from the cloud of, uh, providers. So we often deploy these services in the Middle East, in Europe, in specific countries, and not just the US. That is an important question to ask of any provider. Where is my data going? Where will it reside? Because in many cases, it will sit in the US. Okay, um, And then you've got a decision to make whether that's acceptable for your, for your business. Uh, okay, what is the best approach to install an agent in a Linux environment, e.g. dedicated GUIDs? Okay, um, so good question. So we support many different operating systems. So we have offerings for Windows, Mac, and Linux. That's the main flavors of Linux. I can provide further details should people wish to know that in terms of the actual operating system. It's the main players that you see. It is not Sun Microsystems, unfortunately. Uh, we don't support Unix. We do now have an offering for mobile. So we provide these capabilities for iOS and Android. And the way that customers deploy these agents across the board, for Windows, it's typically SCCM or GPO. Um, and then for things like Mac, for example, uh, you'll forgive me, there are, um, I think it's called a jam for things like that that people use. Uh, and for Linux, it's whatever deployment tool that you want. How we provide these agents is a pre-built uh, software agent. In fact, I can show that on the screen. So if I go to system, uh, download sensors, let me just move the window across. Uh, you've got the ability to download these pre-built sensors. The sensors have a um, configuration ready to go. They come pre-built uh, with your environment details. So they'll dial back and be ready to go. You have zero configuration to, to do. You don't have to, for example, provide any IP addresses, connection types, and all of those sorts of things. Um, we silently install as well, so we require no reboot. Uh, we also support Windows XP, so quite often we'll go into um, older, more silent operating environments, such as ATMs, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, those types of environments, because we require no reboot um, across the board, that is, as well. Okay. Uh, what is the impact on VMware hosts? When installed on multiple VMs? Uh, okay, good, good question. So we don't distinguish today between a virtual machine and a physical machine. So you would deploy this inside uh, every virtual machine that spins up. And the uh, how lightweight that would be would be exactly the same if it was a physical machine. So for example, that 2% and, and five, um, five megabytes per day per device. Um, so there's, yeah, we won't, for example, correlate across those virtual machines. We do support virtual machines. We do support virtual desktop environments such as VDIs as well. That's quite common, okay? Uh, in terms of containers as well, we, we do work in containerized environments. We don't support it today. So where you will get prevention and detection, we just won't tell you what container the process was contained inside today. Okay. Final question, uh, does this replace SIEM type or SIM type of products? Uh, not today. We work um, uh, with a number of your uh, SIEM manufacturers, your, your, your CyberArks, your uh, um, uh, yeah, the other main players, your Q radars, uh, and we deliver those malops that you saw me presenting at the beginning of the screen as an alert. So the idea is we don't overwhelm your security team. We don't deliver every single event to the scene so that we're blinding responders with noise. The idea is we provide you those very singular malops that give you enough information to determine if something's going wrong, and then you would pivot back to our screen typically to do proper detailed response and forensics. Now, going forward, the reason why we're not seen today is that we don't support other third-party platforms, uh, firewall log retention and things, things like that. It's purely our agent at this point. Going forward in, into the future, who, who knows? 
we may end up working into that seam and automation and source space. Okay. Uh, another question. Can we question, uh, my question, sorry, can we quarantine, the, disable the network access to automate it to make, uh, I, can you automate, okay, I think the question is, can you automate quarantine and the isolation during an attack? Uh, today, no. Uh, however, within the next six months, yes. And we have, sh this, is the, this is another technology limitation. This is a conscious decision uh, that us as a vendor has provided. So to, to be frank, you saw me, for example, looking at the breach and hitting you know, isolate and then hitting quarantine and then remediating myself. That is a conscious decision because at, at the moment, uh, there you, you could theoretically create a denial of service on your customers or in your environment where we know that your security tool is going to quarantine and isolate hosts. If we can trigger that automatically, we've created a denial of service attack into your environment. That's a bad thing. Now, however, we recognize in certain scenarios and certain customers, we do want to automate that approach. When there's a large ransomware outbreak uh, where uh, we set thresholds on what we want to quarantine and automate. So imagine if you will, we set a policy that says, delete the file, um, isolate the host, remediate when that host is a laptop, but do not do this to my web server front ends because they're business critical and I want my analysts to look at that. So that in the next six months, that is exactly where we're going. You will have the ability to auto remediate based on criteria. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, another, uh, another question, is, is there an, an additional product required to disable network uh, do, no, so, so to be clear, everything you saw during today's demonstration comes with our standard offering. Um, the only additional products and platforms that we offer are around our services. So although the whole point of Cyber Reason as a platform is to be simple to use and is to reduce those log entries that you saw me talk about right at the beginning, we recognize that some customers are unable or un, uh, are not wanting to manage this platform themselves. So you can either go to a managed service provider and we support those, or you can take those services from Cyber Reason. So we will, for example, go into your platform and say to you and leave you a note and email you and ring you saying, we believe you're under breach and this is what's happened and this is what you should go and do. But ultimately the action is then on you. A level up from that is our services team can monitor your platform, look at those malops, do the same thing again, contact you saying, we've seen a breach, this is what's going on. But by the way, we have remediated, we have isolated, we have changed policy, we have cleared up the fiction and deleted any issues inside your environment. So and that full managed service play. Okay. We also have incident response. So if you are under breach, and even if you're not a Cyber Reason customer today, you can contact us and we will come in and do instant response where we will detect the breaches and hopefully remove the, uh, the uh, adversary in your environment. The other play that we have is right at the beginning of my presentation, I said we have a theoretical uh, unlimited data retention. We're the only ones in the market to do that. That is an additional product. You pay basically for that data retention. It's a service called Replay. Okay. Hopefully that answers uh, all the questions. I've got no more showing. So uh, if you have a question, now's the time to speak. <laughs> Give it a couple of seconds. Okay, so um, I really, really hope that you found this useful in today's uh, session. Hopefully you saw some differentiators, things that make us different um, to, to maybe your current technology. And, you know, as you can see, do research soft sell, research cyber reason. We received our $200 million funding today. The industry is very excited about what we're doing. Uh, we have some very unique technology uh, that makes us very important. So uh, thank you much for, for attending. I'm going to wrap up uh, unless any other questions come through. Okay, thank you very much for attending and have a good day.